interesting. Uh, we had Andy Giesman, our special speaker today, scheduled before the pandemic hit, and then that hit and everything hit the fan. And uh, so we just had to put it on pause, and Lord willing, in the providence of time, uh, it all did come together, and he's able to be with us here today. Andy is no stranger to many of our young people in our church. He has been significantly used of the Lord to uh, wonderfully challenge and shape many of our young people who have gone to Clark Summit University, where he served there for multiple uh, years, and then as well was a keynote speaker at... Uh, uh, teen Leadership Conference many years. Uh, two of my uh, children had the privilege to travel with him on ministry teams for uh, multiple occasions. And, and so what, what's unique about Andy is how God has really wired him with uh, not only a, a passion to reach the next generation, uh, but the ability to do so. And right now he has a special ministry to college young people. And in particular, what he does, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Scranton, teaching philosophy and ethics and a variety of other things as well uh, there. Uh, but his heartbeat is to truly reach the next generation, which really models again what we're about coming off celebrating our 75th uh, anniversary here as a church. Uh, he has a display table out back there with some resources that you can purchase if you're uh, interested to. But uh, Andy, we're just grateful that you can be here and uh, thank you for making it an uh, opportunity uh, for us to enjoy and may God bless you as you do come and minister the word. Thank you. Good morning, church. It is great to finally be here. Um, yeah, I never thought this was going to happen. Uh, with COVID and everything, uh, we had to just put everything on hold and um, never thought that this was actually going to happen, but it is. And um, I'm also just thrilled to be able to be here to speak because I've never spoken here before, although, as Pastor Don said, I I've, have several connections um, here, here at the church. Um, most notably, things that I can remember is I was J Pastor Jeff's admissions counselor at Baptist Bible College like a million years ago. Um, and as I recall, uh, Jeff wasn't sure that he wanted to go to Bible College, and I remember getting on the phone with him and saying, oh no, it's, it's God's will for you to be in Bible College. Um, because I heard another recruiter use that line, I thought, well, if that works for him, I'll, I'll try it. And so here we are. So you can either thank me or curse me for that. Um, but I, I feel somewhat responsible for Jeff, but um, others as well. So it, it's just great to be here this morning. Um, as Pastor told you, my name is Andy. I do have a, a ministry, um, and I want to just point something out right now. Um, I am wearing that same vest and shirt in the picture, so I, I, I'm embarrassed, but there it is. Uh, I do have a different tie, and I do have more outfits than this one, but... Um, as Pastor told you, I do have a ministry called Addison's Walk Institute for Christian Studies. Uh, we are in Scranton. Um, I, I, am, I, I am a missionary to college students. My in is through the classroom. Uh, we, would, we would share m many of the same uh, outcomes and goals as traditional on-campus ministries like Crew, InterVarsity, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Campus Bible Fellowship, those kinds of things. We would share their, their same values and goals, uh, but we are not like them. We're not a club. We are under the radar. So I, I cannot invite students publicly to anything that we're doing. I can't set up a table in the student union building or anything like that. In fact, I don't talk about my official ministry at all, ever, unless, unless I'm asked specifically about it. But my in is through a contact that these other ministries would, would really kill to have, it, have the access that I have. I'm, I'm in the classroom. Because just because I have a ministry does not give me the right to be on the campus, and in this case, the campus of the University of Scranton, I have the right to be on campus because I have a little piece of plastic in my wallet that says faculty on it. So um, I, I am a philosophy professor, and, and because we explore the fundamental issues of life, and I'm very open with my faith, um, students tend to want to come talk to me outside of the classroom, and that's where things happen. Now, I, I wish I had time to regale you with stories of things that happen inside the classroom, because everybody likes a good missionary story, right? When they tried to boil and eat you and all that kind of stuff. We've come close. 
Um, I, I wish I had time to tell you about those things, but uh, God shows up often in the classroom in ways that, that I don't expect, and we see tremendous things happening. But if you want to talk more about the ministry, I do have a display out back. We have some bookmarks. Please take one. This is our, our version of a missionary card. So if you want to take that and you can pray for us, and uh, if you want to ask me any questions, that's great. We do have uh, some books and uh, a few other things that are for purchase back there, and, and all those monies go to help support our ministry. Uh, so again, if you have questions about that, please do not hesitate. Now, I, I am a philosophy professor, and for those of you in the ro room who have known me many years, if you're surprised, I, I was too. Okay, because I never thought this was going to happen. Um, had, had you asked me all those years ago when I was speaking at Teen Leadership Conference, Andy, do you ever think you'd find yourself being a philosophy pro professor in what is effectively a secular environment? No. No, why, why in the world would I want to do that? Um, but God had other plans. But even though I do have a degree in philosophy, my first love is, is uh, history. Oh, there we go. Good. My first love is history. And if, if you ever repeat that to my philosophy professor, I will boldface deny it. But uh, I do love history. In particular, I, I enjoy military history from across time, uh, um, ancient military history, um, World War II military history, World War I. I've read quite a few things on that. And, and I've learned recently, not all that long ago, that the longest running battle of World War II basically spanned the entirety of that war. From September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, all the way to the fall of Germany and, and the Wehrmacht at, in the spring of 1945, uh, there was one battle that was continuously running all that time. It was called the Battle of the Atlantic. And in the Battle of the Atlantic, what you had was German submarines, Unterseeboots, as they were known, or U-boats, would travel in wolf packs and they would prowl the waters of the North Atlantic the Atlantic, the Caribbean, even the Gulf of Mexico, but particularly in the icy waters of the Atlantic, and what they were looking for was allied shipping. The material coming from Canada and the United States was keeping England afloat. Great Britain was one of the last nations of Europe to stand against the Nazi onslaught, and they needed help. They needed material aid. So um, the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, came up with a plan to get stuff to them and it was their lifeline and the Germans knew if they had no material they could not make war so their job was to put as many of those ships on the bottom of the ocean as possible to this day there are thousands of ships entombed in the icy waters of the Atlantic still holding millions of tons of material and buried there in the sea with their ships are tens of thousands of sailors soldiers and marines that were on these ships on their way to England. But these wolf packs prowled. They looked for the ships and they would get in among them and they would sink them at will. Now, there were protections for these convoys, the, the destroyers, and a destroyer's job is to destroy submarines. That's their job. And these destroyers would escort these ships um, and try to Fend, the, fend off the wolves and get them to safety. Um, if you're interested in this, there's an excellent movie on Apple Plus right now called Greyhound. So if you like uh, Tom Hanks movies, and frankly, who doesn't? You know, have you seen the Polar Express? <laughs> that I'm favorably dis, dis, uh, I favorably lean toward the idea of Santa Claus now. Have, have you seen it? It's it's compelling. Just, I'm just saying. Um, he's had some stinkers too, but that was a good one. Um, but in this movie, he plays a destroyer captain, and his job is to shepherd these ships across the Atlantic, and the name of his ship is the Greyhound. Now, these destroyers were known collectively as Greyhounds in World War II, but in this story, that's the name of his ship, and the, the movie's based on a historic novel called The Good Shepherd. His character in that movie is an ardent Roman Catholic man who prays every day and is very much concerned about his men, even concerned about his enemies. Um, but it's interesting, and this is no accident, that his ship is called a Greyhound. And, and I'm going to tell you something I want you to remember as we bring this together at the end. <coughs> Greyhounds have two jobs. One is to protect sheep. The other is to hunt wolves. I, I want you to think about that. 
And the reason I bring this up is because I am in college ministry. And you probably, it would not surprise me if you have some familiarity with the statistics of students that are expected to walk away from their faith once they leave the safety and security of their homes and youth groups and go off to college or the workforce. The statistics are terrible. In fact, they tell us that three out of four students are going to abandon their faith within the first year and most often within the first semester, if not first week of college. Three out of four, that's 75%. Is that not a great recruitment tool for youth ministry? Hey, go to Bible college, go into debt, spend tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, and you probably need to go to seminary too because who wants to hire a 22-year-old pastor? So you're going to need to go to seminary. We want you to pour your life into these students. We want you to take them with you on missions trips. We want you to take them with you when you run errands. We want you to teach them the Bible and theology and study and be up all night and take years off your life by drinking too much Mountain Dew. And we want you to do all these things for those students. And you have a one out of four chance that it's actually going to stick. Well, that's, that's great. Put that on a recruitment poster. For youth ministry. Something is not right. Some, something is, is amiss. And so I've spent the past uh, almost eight years now that I've been involved with this ministry trying to understand not just what the average college student thinks, but how and why. Francis Schaeffer, in his book Escape from Reason, said that if we truly want to be able to speak truth into someone's life, we must not know just what they think, but how they think or their thought language. And I've made it my business to do that. And I've come up with three sets of wolf packs um, that are hunting our students' faith. I'm going to share one of them, one of those three with you this morning. And if this is of interest to you and you want to hear the other two, I guess you'd just have to have me back. If that's not too subtle, I'm sorry. Um, But I I would love to I'd love to come back. But we're going to share one of them with you today. and, And we're going to talk about these things that are hunting our students. And to get us into it, I want to give you one more illustration. It's from one of my favorite books called Beowulf. Perhaps some of you were forced to read this in high school. Would that be true? Anybody ever choose to read it on purpose by themselves? Look at all those hands. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, Well, that's unfortunate because actually Beowulf is among the greatest stories of redemption outside of the Bible that's ever been penned. From the 8th century, some Anglo-Saxon author, we have no idea who this was. Um, But in the story, in the beginning, as you get the background of the story, you realize that um, the, the story is about this group of spear Danes. Those are Danish people that carry spears. Um, and their, their leader, Hrothgar, and Hrothgar has a problem. In his great mead hall called Hararot, uh, it's being ravaged and destroyed by this evil monster, Grendel, who's coming in at night and stealing away the knights. And so he calls for help, and this is where Beowulf the Geat goes to uh, the Danes to help him, and he destroys the monster. And Actually, um, most modern retellings of the story kind of end with that, and then him killing Grendel's mother. Um, But actually, that's not the end of the story. It's at the end when King King Beowulf lays down his life for his people. That's actually the best part of the whole story. But um, we get this background that actually Hararot, this great mead hall one time, this was a place where people who feared God would meet, but that's gone now. And that's been replaced by a darkness. And here's how it's described. Long was the while. The dear Lord endured anguish in every woe and sour deep. Truce he, Grendel, the monster, would not have with any man, nor would withhold his deadly cruelty, nor accept terms of payment. The fierce killer pursued them still, both knights and young, a dark shadow of death, lurking, lying in wait. Men know not whither sorcerers of hell and their wanderings roam. So we're talking about this monster that's coming in and destroying the lives of of the people. And then he says this, the narrator says this about the Danes. At times they, the Danes, vowed sacrifices to idols in their heathen tabernacles in prayers implored the slayer of souls to afford them help against the sufferings of their people. What does that mean? The narrator is telling us that this is a particularly grievous situation because those who are under attack are actually worshiping and praying to the thing that is destroying them. People have been doing that for centuries. 
They were mindful in their hearts of hell, but they knew not the Creator, the judge of deeds, nor had heard of the Lord God, nor verily had learned to praise the guardian of the heavens and, and the King of glory. Woe shall be to him that through fiendish malice shall thrust down his soul into the fire's embrace to look for no comfort and no wise to change his lot. Blessed shall be he that may after his death day go unto the Lord and seek peace in the bosom of the Father. There is no in-between. On the death day that will visit us all, there's going to be one of two outcomes. Either it's going to be an eternity of no comfort and complete loss, or an eternity of complete peace and bliss, being at the side of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In an 8th century story, they understood that. Um, in, in our Bible narratives from 2,000 years ago, we understand that. Um, and our students are faced with a very real possibility of having destroyed lives because the enemy is roaming through the meat halls of our universities looking for those who can destroy. He's hunting. We're told in Scripture that this is going to happen, and we need to make some observations as to how this is happening. So this morning, uh, I want to share with you three deficiencies, on average, that um, the average high school graduate things that they do not have. So I'm not saying particularly anyone in this room, because I really don't know many of you, but this is my observation from nearly 1,000 students coming through my classroom um, some observations I made, some things that they just don't have or are, are, are unable to do. So these, these wolves are kind of the things that um, the average student raises from birth as a little puppy, and then as soon as they get to a place like college, it turns on them and attacks them. So it's a bit of a mixed metaphor, because I'm talking about a deficiency they don't have. I'm actually talking about a wolf that's attacking them. I'm not an English major, so I'm not worried about the mixed metaphor. So um, we're just going to run with that. But let me give you the three. Let me give you the three that we're going to look at this morning. They are no anchor, no boundary, no book. Now, I do have three degrees from a Baptist institution. I could have alliterated this if I want to. <laughs> Believe you me, I have the skill to do that. I mean, I could have had no ballast, no boundary, no book. Huh? I could have done that, but ballast and anchor are not the same thing. So this is what we're going to talk about, and I'm going to just try to give you a little bit of a preview here. Um, it would not surprise me if the first two are a little intuitive for you, like you see them coming. Uh, the third one, you may not see, see coming quite as much, and it might make you a little bit angry. But before you pluck the chickens and heat the tar, just hear me out, okay? Um, but it, it might make you a little bit angry. So again, these are the three deficiencies that I see that the average student just does not have. Um, and if, if by chance you're thinking, well, these are the by and large secular students that you're working with, Andy, surely students in our church, in our fellowship of churches, don't have to worry about this. Yes, they certainly do. Because every person on the planet for the past 25, 30 years has been conditioned to think in, in certain ways from birth, from messages that come all over the place, certainly not from within churches, at least those who preach the gospel and hold the Bible in high esteem, at least not on purpose. But there's these ideas that just are there and they infiltrate, but they're certainly outside in a, in a variety of ways, in TV shows and movies and music, and in just so many different ways. Um, that's why I think these are, these are three of the deficiencies. And if, and if I'm wrong, please feel free to tell me, but I, I don't think I am. So let's talk about this no anchor. What does this mean? Well, again, from birth, um, most of us, so if, if you're around my age and I'm a proud Gen Xer or younger, um, if, if you fit into that demographic, you have heard the same story, you've heard the same message over and over and over again. In fact, how many in this room have ever seen a Disney movie? Okay, if you didn't put your hand up, it's either because you just don't want to participate, and that's just sad, <laughs> or I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know how you go through life without seeing a Disney movie. Um, but if you've ever seen a Disney movie, then you've all heard the same moral of the story, and that is you are at the very center of your universe. You are the center of all things. 
We're told over and over again in those films, um, if you just believe deep down in your heart, then whatever you believe in must be true. Do you know how false of a statement that is? Just because you believe something does not make it true. Just because you believe in Jesus doesn't make him Jesus. Conversely, just because you disbelieve in something does not make it untrue. Um, we as Christians should be a people who are seeking to believe true things and to ask good questions and to find the true things so that we can uh, really follow them. But it, it's not just a matter of what I believe makes it true. I, that's, that makes no sense at all. But we are told um, that we are the center of all things and that we must have an authentic life. And in order to have an authentic life, we must choose our own path. We must follow um, our, our own leading and we must never choose the path of another. And if we're going to have an authentic, actual, real life, that is what we must do. Because you you must decide. You must figure out what you want to do. In fact, I've seen people in youth ministry um, that people from ministries that you would know or at least be familiar with, I've seen online how they put these messages and memes up where they're telling their students, oh, you just need to be you. You just need to be what you need to be. Stop saying that to students. Have you read your Bibles? The Bible actually says that God created humanity perfectly. In fact, at the end of day six of creation, God says something differently than he says the other five days. At the end of the, the first five days, he looks at what he made and said, this is good. At the end of day six, when he makes the pinnacle of creation, humanity itself, which he infuses with the imago Dei, the image of God, he says this is very good. Unlike, unlike all of the ancient uh, creation models and myths, whether it be Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Babylonian, uh, Persian, whatever, uh, Greek, Roman, they all looked at the creation of man as being inherently flawed. It is only the Bible that says, no, God made man good. And although God cannot change, creation can. When the first Adam, representative of all people, ate of that fruit that God told him not to because he had moral responsibility, because Adam was not the anchor, God was and is. But believing the lie, Adam decided to uproot his anchor and let it drift. And when he took a bite of that fruit, all of creation fell. And the story, the redemptive story arc of the Bible, God is telling us, I am going to put you back together. You cannot just be who you are because that's not going to get you anywhere except eternal punishment. Let me be the center of all things, for I am. There's a Greek philosopher, you probably have heard of him, his name is Socrates. In the year 399 BC, Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth by advocating foreign gods. Um, without giving you the entire philosophy lesson there, um, Socrates basically looked around him and asked the question, why is there order instead of disorder? Or to use Greek words, why is there cosmos instead of chaos? What holds it all together? What's at the center of all things? And he said, now we Greeks for centuries have said it's the gods, plural, Zeus, Apollo, Athena, Poseidon. Um, and Socrates said, it can't possibly be the gods because I've read our literature and you can read it as well, just a simple reading of the book Iliad would show you that what Socrates knew, that those gods do not get along, they change their minds, and they don't tell us what they want. He said, that can't be right. Um, if you're not interested in the Greek myths, if you prefer a modern retelling, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe retells that whole story. Um, Tony Stark is Zeus. Actually, the DC Comics is really easy to figure out, right? Aquaman is Poseidon. I'm pretty sure Batman is Hades. But I'm up to, I'll have a debate with you on that. I, I'd love to discuss that. But you, you can just, watch, there's, it's just a retelling of the gods. Um, in fact, uh, in the Greek myths, uh, in the famous Greek myth about talking about how the gods became gods, they had to defeat Titans. Um, those of you who are into this stuff, where is Thanos from? Titan. So it's just a retelling of the old stories. Anyway, Socrates said, it cannot possibly be the gods because... They change their minds, they don't tell us what they want, and they don't get along. So Socrates actually said, I believe it is one God. 
that holds all things together. I do not know who or what it is, but I think it is one God. And do you know what he called it? The Logos. Wait, Andy, the same word that John uses in John 1? Yeah. 400 some odd years later, when John writes to Greeks, he's saying, hey, Greeks, that thing you've always been looking for, I know who it is, and I know where he is. In fact, I know his name. And by the way, the center of all things is what Logos means, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So the, the, the narrative of Scripture tells us that the anchor is not the individual, the subject. But it, it, is, it is a who, but it's not us. It is God himself. But um, our young people and many of us in this room have been conditioned, and you may not have even thought about it, you're, you're bombarded with the idea over and over and over again that you and I are actually a center of all things. This is one of the issues I see with my students constantly. And many of them will identify as Roman Catholic, and many of them are actually trying to be good Catholics, and, and they're, they're trying to do the thing. But when it really comes down to it, they have a buffet view of reality. Well, I'll take some from over here, I'll take some from over there, um, but I do not have to accept all of it. Yes, you do. It's, it's an all or nothing proposition. Now, there is um, a book, so it wouldn't surprise me if some of you have heard of um, Beowulf or Iliad or any of those other books. Now, if you've heard of this book, I'll be very impressed. Um, but there is a book from 1945 that actually is kind of the, the Bible for this whole issue. It's called Mount Analog. Has anybody ever heard of this book before? Really? Well, we have, we have to talk. All right, so Mount Analog. Um, so this book is written in 1945 by a French guy named René de Maul, and it's uh, interesting for many reasons. One, it, it literally ends mid-sentence. And if you're thinking, well, it's because he's French and he's trying to do some fancy avant-garde thing. No, nope. it's because he was writing, somebody came to the door, he put his pen down, he went to answer the door, and he was too sick to ever pick up his pen to continue writing, and he died, of tuberculosis. So the book um, ends, but it doesn't conclude. So it doesn't tell you what happens. But in this book, um, René Damal is kind of writing from his own thought experience. So René Damal was born in the early 20th century France, and early 20th century France is still reeling from the French Revolution. If, for those of you who are interested in history and, and the grand sweep of it, do a comparison and contrast of the American, French, and Russian revolutions in that order. You will find them to be radically different. At least the last two are much different than the first one. The French Revolution had really awesome slogans like, I know, let's strangle the last of the royalty with the entrails of the priests. That's nice. <laughs> That's really nice. Um, people would name their, their children the French equivalent of there is no God. It was a bloody, godless affair, the French Revolution. And France, it could be argued, <coughs> to this day is still dealing with it, but they certainly were in the early years of the 20th century. So René de Maul was born into that world. He was also born into a world where they had to move around France to escape the horrors of World War I, which he saw. So pretty early on, René Dumal gave up any belief in God, yet he still wanted a connection with the divine, without God. One of the ways he tried to accomplish that was by huffing chemicals. That's how he destroyed his lungs, hence dying of tuberculosis. Just, you know, pro tip, don't do that. It's a good way to get yourself killed. But he was trying to figure out a way to, to touch the divine. Um, and, and he's not the only person in history that tried drugs doing that. Um, just a few days ago, um, marked the anniversary of the death of J John F. Kennedy, right? Do you know who else died on that day, very famously? C.S. Lewis. And another guy named Aldous Huxley, who is most famous for writing his book, Brave New World, but also wrote a book called The Doors of Perception, in which he suggested that one use LSD in order to connect with the divine or the supernatural. And for those of you a bit older than me and remember such things, you might remember 60s supergroup The Doors, Jim Morrison. They named their band after that book, The Doors of Perception. So René Damal was not the only one who did that. Um, so in this book, 
he has the guy that's writing it, kind of narrating it, or telling the story within the book. <coughs> he writes this think piece for the French equivalent of National Geographic magazine. And um, sends in this think piece and, and basically says, you know, I've recognized that all major religions worldwide have mountain motifs. Is that true? Are there mountain motifs in Christianity? Any important things happen on mountains in our Bibles? Yes. In fact, if, you've, if you're a person thinking, you know, I'd like to think of something, a, a new idea to, for, for an approach to my own personal devotions, may I suggest that you study the mountains in, in your Bible. And then when you're done with that, trees. And it, you might really be blessed if you do that. Anyway, so he said, yes, uh, the, the, and he mentions the Old and New Testament um, in this think piece, but he also talks about places in the world that don't even have mountains and they make them like the pyramids of Egypt or the ziggurats of Mesopotamia um, or actual places in the world that have holy mountains like Tibet, Nepal, Mount Everest, that kind of thing. Um, and he said, so on these mountains, um, metaphorically at least, you go to the top and your feet are on the earth and you can reach up and touch the divine. You can. And so in this piece, he said, imagine that there's an actual real place like this on earth where this could happen. So he gets a letter back. Um, from a guy, a, a, a guy named Father Sogol. He gets a letter back and he says, I actually think there is such a place. I'm planning an expedition. Let's go. And so they go off on this expedition to go find this thing, um, to look for it. And, and they actually find it, but you don't ever figure out what happens because the book just stops before they get to the top. But in the book, there are three things that happen all the time. First is this, I want to touch the divine without God. Second is this idea of seeking your own path the authenticity piece, the anchor that I'm telling you about. And like I said, this is like the Bible from what I'm, for, for what I'm telling you. Because in this story, um, over and over again, is this idea that you must seek your own path. You cannot seek the path of another. Now, I want you to just stop and think, how many times do you think that message gets, gets thrown at us on a regular basis? It is all the time, if you just stop and think about it, right? You just, you, if you just stop and realize, wow, yes, it really is quite ubiquitous. It is everywhere. But I want you just now to stop and think about how, how opposed that is to the Christian worldview. A simple verse like John 14, 6, when Jesus have, says of himself, I am the way, the, the path, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you want to touch the divine? How do you get there? Through Jesus, the anchor. Um, but in this book, it's, we are told over and over again, you just seek out your own authenticity and you never, ever, ever take the path of another. That is truly uh, the inauthentic route and it's, it's cheating. So you have to create your own path. Now this guy, um, Father Sogol, um, actually in his story, he talks about getting kicked out of a monastery, and I want you to look at his last name, his name there, Father Sogol. What do you see? What is it? It's logos, backwards. It's backwards logic. That's not a mistake. That's, that, that was something that Damal did on purpose. But here's what he said as he's talking to this dude who wrote the letter. He said, but where to look, where to begin? I had already traveled the world, stuck my nose everywhere into all sorts of religious sects and mystical cults. But to each one, it was always maybe yes, maybe no. Why should I stake my life on this one rather than another? You see, I had no touchstone. You know what a touchstone is for? A touchstone is to determine uh, the, the authenticity of precious metal. Um, the closest equivalent we have today is if you go in some place and you're buying something and you pay with a $50 bill um, and the person behind the counter who is really trained, uh, obviously, in the art of recognizing counterfeit bills, um, gets out their little marker and draws on it. And if it leaves a mark, you're in trouble, right? It's, that's the touchstone for these bills. So um, in his case, he's saying, I had no touchstone, I had no center. You see, I, I've stuck my nose into everything and I can never figure out a yes or a no because I have no anchor to understand what is actually true. In 
an article uh, written just a couple years ago by a guy named Rod Dreher in an article called Seminary Confidential. He's talking about mainline seminary. So he's not talking about Baptist Bible Seminary or Dallas Theological Seminary. He's talking about the, the mainline denomination seminaries. But he says this, an authentic journey is completely unshackled from biblical, theological, ethical, or community restraints unless the traveler personally chooses them. This is what I see among my students. It's not necessarily that they're denying the truth of what Scripture says, but they just have to figure out, well, is this something that I actually want to uh, take on myself? They don't stop and ask, is it really true? Because they don't care. It doesn't matter to them because they don't understand the difference between subjective and objective reality. So if, they're, if they don't understand the difference between those things, then the ultimate anchor point or the ultimate decision maker in anything is whom? The individual. That's a dangerous place to be. And if that is the case, then that leads to no boundary. Now, like I said, this is probably intuitive. You, you could probably see this coming. But if there is no anchor, then there are no guardrails. There's nothing to keep you from flying off the edge, right? Or to use a, a more poetic term from Fyodor Dostoevsky, 19th century Russian novelist, in his book, The Brothers Karamazov, has one of the characters say, if there is no God, anything is possible. Or perhaps a better translation would be, if there is no God, anything is permissible. What's to stop you? So, if students believe they have no anchor, they naturally are going to believe they have no boundary, other than what they arbitrarily set up for themselves. This is where students sometimes become the great experimenters, and I do not mean in the laboratory. I mean, if it can be ingested, injected, or inhaled, it probably will be. Why? Because intuitively, they're trying to figure out a real connection to reality. That's called the Imago Dei, the image of God. This is what separates humanity from all the rest of creation. So they're still trying to figure it out, but they're trying to do so in, a, in, in most cases, a godless way, so they'll try anything. This is also where students will experiment with other things, like who they go to bed as versus who they go to bed with. And that orientation can change on a daily basis. Or the personal identity part will change on a daily basis because they have no boundary, because they have no anchor. I could tell you stories of students who are not with us any longer. I mean, they passed away because they had no boundary and decisions that they made dying tragically. As we watch them coming and slipping over the edge, it's because they have nothing holding them back. And students who identify as Christians who have been bombarded with this stuff, yes, they know the verses, yes, they've been taught theology, but perhaps they've never been taught the greater worldview and how it all fits together, or what really is at the center of all things. This is where they begin to give it a little slack, and they start heading towards the edge themselves. And the other sets of wolf packs don't help either, as they're chasing them there. But there is no boundary. And again, I want you to think about how this just flies in the face of what we are told in the biblical narrative. I mean, the grand story from start to finish. It, trees, by the way. Is there a tree at the beginning? Yes. Is there an important tree in the middle? Is there an important tree at the end? Yeah, and it's one giant story that fits together, just like the mountains um, as well. I, I pastored in the inner city of Scranton for a while. I don't know if you know this, but Scranton's motto is, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> um, that's our motto. Um, and I, I pastored in the inner city, and so as a pastor for 10 years, as you can imagine, I did my share of weddings and funerals. And I did far more funerals than I did weddings. And most of the funerals I conducted were for people quite a bit younger than me who died horribly. How many churches do you know that actually can say two of their former youth group kids were murder victims? We had murder victims, we had suicides, we had um, lots of drug overdoses, um, and people dying of diseases they didn't need to have. Um, There's a young woman that, that was um, uh, kind of part of our church, her sister and brother-in-law, um, Scranton people came to Jesus, still serving to this day. 
um, faithfully at that church, but I, I got a call one, one morning. This, this woman's sister's boyfriend overdosed on heroin, and they asked if they could do a memorial service at, at our church, and, and we did. It was very sad. And then the girlfriend, so this lady's sister, she disappeared off the grid for years. And, um, and so Naomi asked us to pray for her sister. Her name is Becky. Asked us to pray for her, and we prayed a very difficult prayer, and that was God do whatever it takes to bring Becky back. And we meant it. Years went by. And then we got a phone call. Becky had shown up at one of the local emergency rooms, jaundiced, her skin and eyes are yellow because she has cirrhosis of the liver. At 34 years of age, she had pickled her liver with alcohol. And she also had, um, she was also HIV positive and had hepatitis. And they told us one of those three things was going to kill her. It turned out it was the cirrhosis. And mercifully, she died peacefully because that often doesn't happen. And I will save you the gory details of how someone normally dies of cirrhosis of the liver. But I'm happy to tell you that, that Becky surrendered her life to Jesus, and she is with him today. Um, and, I, and my wife and I were there when she breathed her last in hospice. Um, and we were thankful that her suffering was over, still sad. And Naomi asked me to speak, of course, at her funeral. Um, and she asked me specifically to speak on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you know it, say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Or in the ancient Hebrew mind, he is taking you home. Right? Or the wagon wheels are in the right grooves. There's a difference between a groove and a rut. Right? Okay. So the wagon wheels are in the right grooves, and God is taking you home. You follow him. The path has been made. The boundaries are set for you, for your good and his glory. Every time, yes. So I, I spoke. Um, Becky, her remains were cremated. She, she was in an urn on the table right in front. Our, our church was um, homeless at the time. We, we had to borrow uh, another church, an old church in town, and it had um, a, a balcony that overhang. Um, uh, the, the auditorium that was kind of in a, a horseshoe shape, and there were benches and pews all under there, and it was very dark in there. I couldn't really see what was going on. So as I'm, as I'm talking about um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, <coughs> and I'm, I'm explaining it as kindly and as nicely as I can, there are some teenagers over here that I could not see or hear. Um, as I got to the part, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. He's going to guide you. One of them said, ain't no God going to tell me what to do. Now, I'm glad I didn't hear it because I don't know what I would have done, you know, because it's not the time to, like, get in a fight with a, with a teenager. Um, I'm not sure there's ever a good time to get in a fight with a teenager, but uh, that certainly was not the time or the place. Well, um, right after I was done, in the order of service, Naomi was going to come up and give a, a eulogy for her sister. She heard them. Friends, I've heard few sermons that fiery in my life. And she was saying things like, if you want to wind up in a can before your 35th birthday, keep it up. She's not wrong. No boundary. Lastly, no book. And I'm going to try to go as fast as I can. If you could just give me five more minutes, we're going to wrap this up. So, no book. Now, this is the one I, I told you, you you may not see coming. Um, and what I mean by this is that on average, I have found, on average, 18-year-olds um, are functionally illiterate. Now, clearly, they know how to read words on paper. That's not what I mean. What I mean is they don't know how to read a book. All they know how to do is use a book to mine it for data. Data does not equal knowledge. Knowledge does not equal wisdom. Just because you have the apps on your phones that you can get instant information or data from does not mean that you know anything. Certainly doesn't mean that you have wisdom. It just means that you have the data. You can bring up and then subsequently forget, right? I, when I was a kid, some of you can, can attest to this, I knew 30, 40 phone numbers. You know how many I know today? 
two, except for the numbers of my childhood friends, those I still remember, which don't really come in all that handy because they don't live there anymore. <laughs> uh, but I know two, mine and my wife's, um, that's it. I, I, I can't remember phone numbers. Um, why, do, why not? Because I have the world in my pocket. Um, but th th they, don't understand, they don't understand how to read a book. And, and I have started figuring this out when I first started teaching um, ethics a number of years ago. And when we teach that, we, we have them read the first... Um, uh, th there are four short books that deal with the accusation and execution of the Greek philosopher Socrates, uh, written by his most famous student, Plato. Um, and the, the second one they read is called The Apology. So after, um, after Socrates is accused of corrupting the youth by advocating foreign gods, by saying there's one god, he's put on trial for his life. And so in the little short book, The Apology, or The Defense of Socrates, it is him giving his defense. And the way I teach my classes is I have my students read those things, and then they come in, and, and they're, they're ready to discuss it. Um, well, that's how it's supposed to work. And yes, it works sometimes. So they're supposed to come in and discuss it. So they, they, came, they come in after reading that, and I say to them, okay, um, what did you think? And I was shocked. The first time I asked them that question, and this group of students said, oh, he got what he deserved. What? Like, nobody says that. Nobody says that. Everybody recognizes the injustice of what happened to him. That would be like saying, yeah, Jesus probably deserved to die on a cross. Like, I, I don't know anybody that says that outside of, like, Friedrich Nietzsche. So I don't know of anybody who says that kind of thing. I thought, well, th this is just a one-off. Well, it's, it's happened more than once. It doesn't happen every time, but it happens a lot. And I couldn't figure out how... How do you not see this? <clears throat> and then I finally read a book called The Closing of the American Mind by a guy named Alan Bloom, published in 1986. And Alan Bloom said when he first started teaching at, right after World War II, all of his students knew the same story. What the story do you think that was? The Bible. They all knew it. Not that they all agreed to it or lived by it, but they all knew it. And then he said the next generation in the tumultuous 60s, they didn't know it, but they still had uh, blank slate hearts upon which the narrative could be written. And then by the time he gets to the mid-1980s, he, he said, not only is it, a, it is, is it blank, but it's a substance more like tungsten to which nothing sticks. And they can't figure out a story because they have no background, wisdom, or information. You see, when, when someone reads... They have a, a, a framework of wisdom that they can pull ideas from as they're engaging with new material. If all we ever do is mine books for data, and sometimes pastors do that with the Bible, um, and I'm certain that's not true here, but in places they, they just lift out ideas and set them down and never connect them to the whole. That's what I've been trying to say the whole time. The entirety of the redemptive narrative and how does that demonstrate itself that that's the way the world really is. You can't do that if you're just pulling, pulling out your pet verses and setting them down. That's data mining. And that's not helping anyone. So let me give you the opposite of what that looks like. Um, so my son, who's going to turn 13 here um, in a few days, uh, when he was nine years old, came to me and said, Dad, I want to watch the Lord of the Rings movies. And because we parent in what I like to call the right way, we said, um, you're going to have to read them first. And my kids are good readers. They had already read The Hobbit, um, so they were kind of prepped. And uh, I recognize that The Lord of the Rings is tough sledding um, for adults, but you know, particularly for a kid. And so I said, look, you can take your time. Just work your way through it. It's going to take you a while, but it's going to be worth it. And when you're done, yes, we will watch the films together. Um, but I said, Sean, I'm going to tell you my favorite chapter in every, in every volume and then when you get there, we'll have something that you and I can really spend some time and talk about. I said, okay, Dad, what's your favorite chapter in the Fellowship of the Ring? And for some of you, this isn't going to mean anything, but for those of you who are speaking my language, you're welcome. Um, in the Fellowship of the Ring, I said, my favorite chapter is called The Bridge of Khazad-dûm. He said, that, that sounds kind of scary. Well, we'll find out. And so he's working on it, and he's working on it a long time. And I kind of forgot all about that until one morning in the summer I was coming downstairs just getting up needed to get some caffeine to my central nervous system and I did not even make it all the way to the bottom floor because I was stopped on the landing by a very upset nine-year-old boy who clearly 
been crying. His face is red, his eyes are red, he's got snot coming out of his nose, he's got the quiver lip, everything happening, and he says, Dad, Gandalf dies? <laughs> oh, I guess you read The Bridge of Cause of Doom, haven't you? Yes! <laughs> well, let me get some coffee and we'll talk about it. He's like, Dad, I'm like, look, I need the caffeine. Can I, can you guys give me a break on that? Anybody, would you do the same thing? I know you would, <laughs> right? So, okay, let me get the coffee. And then we go and we sit on our front porch on the swing. And I said, Sean, were you crying when you told me about Gandalf just a little while ago? He's embarrassed. He's not trying to be a tough guy. He never has been, but he doesn't want to cry in front of his dad. He's like, yeah, I was. And I looked at him and I said, I'm so proud of you. What? Dad, I'm crying about a fake wizard <laughs> and a made-up story and a place that doesn't exist. It's not real! I'm glad he recognizes that. That's a good thing. Um, I haven't ruined him too much. I said, I agree with you, Sean, that these things are not real, but let's talk about some things that are. What about love, friendship, brotherhood, sacrifice, leadership, truth, the ability to put, place oneself between their friends and the enemy? Only a character who understands an anchor and a boundary can say to a creature, you shall not pass. I am a servant of the secret fire. Are those things real, Sean? Yeah, Dad, those things are real. Right, and you recognize the death of them in the death of a character that you connected with. I did, and you mourn the loss. I do, that's good. Because you're gonna be able to do something that many of your classmates will never be able to do. Um, that's, it's, it's that sense, uh, every time I study the apology and I, and I get ready to teach it again, I, I'm rooting for Socrates. FYI, he never gets exonerated. He's sentenced to death every time. Spoiler alert. Every time. It's the same thing I feel every time I take communion. One of the great paradoxes of Christianity, we're celebrating life by celebrating death of not a good man, but the good man. Right? It's, it's how I feel every time I, I'm one of those people that reads Lord of the Rings once a year. I start on Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. Um, I, I start reading it every year. Um, and and I, I, I root for Gollum every time. Why? Because he's redeemable. Those of you who have read the book, uh, the books, just let me remind you at the very end, how many eagles does Gandalf send to Mount Doom? Why? Maybe Sam, maybe Frodo, maybe Gollum. Because he's not so far gone that he's irredeemable. It's how I feel when I, when I study Iliad. and I, I want Hector to beat Achilles because I hate Achilles. Never happens. Um, but we have got to be a people that engage, I, uh, that engage in battle at the level of ideas. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and following, Paul says um, to the believers in Corinth, he says, look, we are in a fight, but we're not in a fight like the world fights. We're not going out to punch a pagan in the face, much like Ephesians 6. However, we are in a battle, but the weapons we use are not the, the, the weapons of the world. They are divinely forged so that we can tear down the strongholds that set themselves up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive for Christ. That is going to require some learning. That's going to require some discipline. I'm begging you in the name of Jesus, be people of the book, particularly the Bible, but other books. And I even need you to read things that you know you diametrically disagree with. Why would I do that? So you know what the enemy is plotting. And then encourage the students in your lives to do the same thing. Yes, have the bumper sticker, my kid could beat up your kid in MMA, or whatever. Yes, my kid is an awesome athlete. Yes, I'm going to live vicariously through my football playing son, or whatever, and I'm going to honor him like the gods of old. Well, that's fine, but actually, how about, what if we uh, encourage them at the level of their minds and toughen them up with what they know so that they can actually step into a world and make a difference and be resilient to the attacks of the enemy.
I'm radically out of time, so I'm going to have to close. Um, I had a quote from uh, Alfred the Great I'd really like to share with you, but I don't have time. But I, I would like to just leave you um, with a, a benediction. If you would like to talk more about um, our talk here right after, and, and thank you for your graciousness in letting me go over, I'd be happy to do that. But uh, I do want to give you a benediction. And be, uh, benediction, of course, comes from the Latin benedictus, which just means drop the mic. So <laughs> that's what we're... You didn't know that, did you? Yep, Latins. I like you. You laugh at my dad jokes. We're going to be We're going to be friends. Um, so it's a two-parter. One is a paraphrase from a, a movie script, and some of you are going to recognize it, and then the last is from Jude. But to begin, there may come a day when Christians are called to abandon their students to their self-love, to the wiles of the enemy, to his traps, lies and deceits but it is not this day now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore Amen. Amen. That was stretching and substantive and helpful. Thank you very much, Andy, for uh, that message. And uh, once again, we don't know where you might be in your spiritual journey. But as we say often here, everyone has a next step. And if maybe you're facing a very real challenging season of confusion right now, we would count it a privilege to help you see how the book has the answers. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, this morning, for the privilege to worship you, for the privilege of knowing truth, having it changed our lives because of the reality and the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you for that truth that has set us free. And we pray that all the more the mission of our lives would be about, about seeing others who are lost, who are hopeless, come to that truth that will likewise set them free. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing on us as we leave here. For those that are, might be even with us this morning struggling, that, God, you would bless them with the grace of initiative to seek your answers through godly counsel that will help them and give them the clarity that their souls long for. And so we pray that you dismiss us with your blessing now. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great rest of the day.